Ah, the miracle of flight. Once only accessible to those ordained by nature to see the world from above, and only dreamt of by those on the ground. How have us land dwellers managed to lift ourselves off the earth and take to the skies? Well, you see, the air, eh, well, it, uh, and the wings, they, uh, the, the air needs to go around and down, and, uh, well, you see, the pressures, they are, uh, un uneven, and, um, <laughs> choking aside the actual physics of flight and lift is well understood and characterized mathematically, but giving a qualitative description using spoken language is actually pretty difficult. Lots of textbooks ranging from physics books to pilots' flight handbooks actually get the explanation of lift wrong, giving the reader explanations that are incorrect theories of flight. Many other books and, dare I say, YouTube videos give would-be definitive answers which, in reality, only contain part of the truth or whole picture and completely omit the fact that flight is actually pretty dang difficult to conceptually understand. But, I'm gonna try. Let's start with something that's very easy to understand. The four forces of flight for aircraft. Here's our plane doing its thing. Obviously, as with all things near our ball of rock and stuff called the Earth, it has a gravitational force acting on it that points downward toward the center of the planet. This is commonly known as weight. This weight is the bane of all airplanes and the engineers who design them. Now, in case you've never seen a plane before, they often fly forward through the air. To do that, they need some sort of force to propel them, called the thrust, generated using a propeller or jet engine. Traveling through the air creates a drag force, both from the friction of the air and the pressure of the air, so drag is a force that opposes thrust. And finally, airplanes have these things called wings, which are able to generate a magical force called lift when air passes around them. This force lifts the airplane up from the ground, opposing the weight, and allowing us to fly. That's all pretty straightforward. So let's talk about that lift force. A true explanation of lift is both difficult and certainly does not lend itself to simplification. A lot of the conceptual reasoning that I'm referencing for this video is from a paper written by Doug McLean, a former aerodynamicist from Boeing, and he states that if you're looking for an easy explanation to give to the average person, then explaining lift as a result of flow turning is probably best. This explanation for lift can also be found on NASA's website, and it's based around Newton's laws, particularly the third one. Every action or force has an equal and opposite reaction or reaction force opposing it. If you're standing next to your friend and you try to shove them, then you're also going to be shoved back too. You'll need to brace yourself to successfully execute the shove. Well, in the case of airplanes, the wing is you and the air is your friend. You can sort of think of gravity as the brace, but eventually the shove becomes so powerful that it's stronger than gravity and flight miraculously occurs. Let's drop this metaphor before it gets too convoluted. Here is the profile of a wing, often called an airfoil. Also, it's helpful to think of the physics in the reference frame of moving along with the wing or riding on the airplane, so the wing is stationary and the air is rushing by. Anyways, see how the wing curves and the wing tip is pointed downward? Well, it uses that downward facing profile to push the air down, and as we know from Newton's third law, if we're pushing something down, even air, it'll have an equal and opposite reaction. The air pushes back, and the result is an upward force known as lift. Take a look at this image. It shows streamlines or paths of parcels of air as they move around the wing. Note how the air is moving straight when it comes into the frame, and upon leaving the wing, it's pointed downward. Moving all that air downward is what creates the upward force. If you're still having trouble wrapping your head around this, you can actually do an experiment in your own home. All you need is a spoon and a faucet. Turn the faucet on and hold the spoon with two fingers like so, food side down. Note as you bring the spoon into the stream, the water starts to curve. 
and when the water reaches the tip of the spoon, it's sent forward and away. That's exactly what a wing does with the air. Now, if you remove the spoon from the water, and still only holding it gently with two fingers, you should be able to feel the lift force retreat, and the spoon will settle back and release some tension on your fingers. Your mileage may vary depending on how powerful your sink is, but for my average sink, I can definitely feel it. So, there you go. You visualized and felt lift. That's it. That's the answer, right? Well, kinda. For teaching most people and younger audiences the basic sciences, that's enough to at least give a basic grasp of what's happening. But it's lacking for a more holistic approach. The problem is that, as the experiment would seem to show, the wing does not affect only the air immediately moving around it. In fact, wings in flight generate a pressure field and airspeed change in a very large area surrounding them, much larger than the wing itself. For commercial airliners, the pressure and velocity of air can be affected even dozens of feet above or below the wing. So how do we explain that physically? Well, it's much more difficult and unfortunately there's no neat experiment to visualize how the pressure field is created, which is unfortunate because understanding the pressure field is critical to get a whole picture of lift and it's oftentimes omitted or underplayed in explanations. Let's put our wing back in the air. Think of the air as a deformable continuum that, when something like a wing is introduced, it must deform and adapt to the shape of the wing. Therefore, even when the air is rushing past it, the continuum must still conform to the shape. That's pretty easy to see on the bottom, the air just gets pushed down, but it's important to note that this happens on the top as well. We can't just leave empty space in this region as if the incoming air were to rush straight back, so the flow conforms to the downward traveling face. This is all well and good. We basically just described the flow downturning, right? Well, remember, the wing affects a huge area of air, not just what touches it, and it does that through the pressure field. The pressure field is created by the movement of air around the wing, and in turn, the pressure field sustains air movement. The two phenomena are mutually reciprocal and sustaining. I know this is still a little confusing. Let's draw the pressure field around the wing. On top, we have decreased pressure, and on the bottom, we have increased pressure. I've used different colors to represent different magnitudes of pressure. The magnitude of pressure difference is, of course, highest near the wing and tapers off the further away you go. As with all things, air wants to flow from areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. Think of a balloon. When you blow into it, you're increasing the pressure inside, and when you release the end, the higher pressure air rushes out to the lower pressure outside, and the balloon flies around the room. So let's draw some arrows showing which way the air wants to flow. You can see above the wing, we have the lowest pressure right on the wing, so the air is flowing downwards. Below the wing, the highest pressure is right on the wing, so the air wants to escape that area, and again, the flow is downward. This is consistent with how we understand lift. The wing pushes air downward. But using this pressure approach, we can also get an understanding of what happens in front of and behind the wing before the air even touches it. If we look at those streamlined paths that the air takes again, you can see in front of the wing, the air turns up, a phenomenon known as upwash. If we go back to the pressure plot and draw arrows based on our pressure contours, that checks out. Also, the arrows show the air speeding up above the wing and the air slowing down below the wing. That's also consistent with airflow observations. Air moving above the wing travels faster than below the wing. After the air leaves the wing and returns to the free stream, you can see it slowly curves back up. This is created again by the pressure field, which you can see now points upward behind the wing. Here you can see the streamlines overlaid on top of the pressure field, and the curvature of the streamlines coincide with the direction of the arrows. So the pressure field is able to create this large swath of air movement very far from the wing. But how exactly is this pressure field created? Well, for that, we once again turn to Newton's laws. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction, and air has mass, so accelerating air 
be it downward, upward, or horizontally, requires a force. The air pushes back against the pressure difference due to its inertia and resistance to being accelerated, and thus that reaction force creates and sustains the pressure difference. So if we think of it in terms of an airplane wing starting from rest and slowly accelerating, the air is forced to follow the downward curvature of the wing in order to maintain the continuum. The mass of the air resists this downward turning action, therefore creating a pressure field. The pressure field then creates further air movement in a larger area by the method we described earlier, even beyond where the wing touches, and this cycle continues, the two phenomena sustaining one another. Both are necessary for lift, and understanding both is critical to understanding how a wing can affect such a large region of air. Now, if this doesn't make sense, I wouldn't be too stressed about it. As someone with an engineering degree, it's still very difficult for me to grasp, and even aerodynamics experts debate on the best way to qualitatively explain lift. I've been thinking about making this video for nearly a year now, but every time I start, I give up because I'm afraid that my own knowledge is too lacking. But remember, like I said in the beginning of this video, this discussion is largely irrelevant to the field of aeronautics. We have equations that accurately predict lift, the velocity field, and the pressure field. The difficulty only arises trying to explain it using language and not math. Anyways guys, that'll do it for today. Let me know what you thought of the video. My last video, Simulating Rocket Trajectories with Python, got a lot more attention than I was expecting, so thank you so much if you're new here. The objective of this channel is basically for me to make any video I feel like in the realm of engineering, space, aviation, or something completely different if it strikes my fancy. Please take a subscription under advisement if you think it would be pleasing to you. Bye.